and thank you, Margie. I was back, sitting back here, and Tom leaned back to me. He's like, that girl can preach. <laughs> so thanks for setting things up, putting the focus where it duly belongs. And hey, that choir it was moving. That reading was really incredible. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> appreciate the passion. Appreciate the love. Appreciate you ministering to us that way. And there, there is room in the choir for you as well. So, you see what I did there? I just put that together. I turned this thing on. Um, because it's a powerful ministry, and uh, it blesses us all, and you can use your gift and your voice, which is important for us to hear that as well. Okay, well, this morning we are indeed turning back to the Gospel of John. If you do have a Bible, go ahead, open it up. We're at John chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 19. We're going to look at this next section. I do want to remind us that in John's gospel, he is building the case that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you and I may have life in his name. Here is the key verse in this book, and it's going to be up here on the screen, and we're going to say it together, and so as soon as you can turn to the next slide, that would be great. Because there it is. Okay, so let's just read these words together to get it in our mind and in our heart. So here we go, John 20, 31. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Amen. That is the purpose of the gospel that is the purpose of this book of John and hopefully you will memorize this put it in your heart and recognize what is being conveyed to us so John again is looking to prove the point of his thesis saying that Jesus indeed is the son of God which is one of his um, one of his title Title. So in order to prove his point, John does so like a perhaps a good trial lawyer. He's looking to prove his point, so he brings up evidences, he brings up signs, he brings to us the teaching of Jesus, what he did, and he also brings up expert eyewitnesses to the accounts and the teaching of Christ. So one of these expert witnesses that John calls is none other than John the Baptist, who at that time was well known and highly regarded by the people of Israel. Crowds were coming out to the Jordan to be baptized by him, and they saw John as an important religious figure. Now, the truth is that John the Baptist stands like a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you're familiar with the Bible at all, and if you read the last book and the last verses of the Old Testament, it talks about a person, a Elijah, so to speak, that would come proclaiming or preparing the way of the Lord, and turning the hearts of children back to the Father. And so then in the opening pages of the New Testament, when we see this person, John the Baptist, and we hear this prophecy about him that came to John's father, Zechariah, who was a priest. They were waiting, and this is what was said of John the Baptist. He said that he would... Turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Okay, so if you are an Old Testament Jew, and if you are, again, familiar with your Bible, you would read that in the Old Testament, and there was a 400-year pause until the time was right, and this priest was in the temple, the angel of God announced that the son going to be born to you, Zechariah, and your barren wife, Elizabeth, he is that voice calling in the wilderness, 
This is a significant announcement. And John the Baptist is a significant character bridging again the Old Testament and its prophecies as to what was to come. Then with the New Testament and the beginning of this Lord, this Messiah. And so understand this about John. And this role is exactly what he did. We read in Mark chapter 1, this about John the Baptist, it says, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So what was prophesied in the Old Testament, what was proclaimed by the angel in the New Testament, John fulfilled, walking out God's calling on his life. And his primary role was to prepare people to receive Christ, calling them to repent as the Spirit of God calls us first to repent so that we can also receive Jesus the Christ. So John was doing his ministry. And John, the writer of our gospel, brought forward the testimony of John the Baptist as an expert eyewitness to the identity of Jesus. Now, not surprisingly, John the Baptist had strong testimony. However, to those who were asking him questions, he veiled that testimony. And a day later, he revealed the full character of who this one who was coming after him was. And so we are going to read this passage and what John brings forward to us by the Spirit of God that we would analyze the evidence of what is being brought forward. We saw in the preamble of this book this mighty and massive and powerful statement talking about in the beginning was the word and John sets this up powerfully and profoundly and declares that Jesus indeed is the Son of God. And now to, again, build his case, he sets things up, and here is John. And I want you to consider today a couple things. Number one, if you are a believer, you already believe these things, that that testimony would go deeper in your heart, that your faith was built on the solid rock evidence of eyewitnesses, the Spirit of God, the teachings and signs that Jesus committed, that your faith will be strengthened today. Now, perhaps you're on the edge, and you're visiting here, and you're disinvestigating Christianity and the claims of the Bible. I want you to consider these things. Don't just take my word for uh, who I believe Jesus is. Take the word for what it proclaims Jesus is. And it is spread all throughout from cover to cover. And we see the example and the focal point of Christ throughout Scripture, throughout history, and throughout the world. If you are a person kind of on the fence about these things, consider this. Ask God to show you the truth about Christ because His identity matters to us all because he said things that have weight and authority. So consider these things. All right, so let's now jump into our text. Again, this is John chapter 1, verses 19, and we're going to go through a number of these. I'm reading in the ESV version today, so if your version does not match perfectly with this, now you know why. So different translations and different versions. So here we go, John chapter 1, starting with verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? Now John confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. Then they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He says, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Then who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? 
John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Here is our first point about Jesus this morning. Number one, that Jesus is Lord. Now John was saying that from this passage as these people were coming to him because the religious leaders and religious leaders even today want to figure everybody out, figure exactly their angle, their motive, what they're getting at. And so those in Jerusalem, which was at the seat of power away from where John was baptizing, sent their messengers, their minions out to find out what the heck is going on there so they would know how to deal with this person. As you read the Gospels, you find out that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, were jealous, right? And on the lookout and trying to squash any other uprising or religious thought in the area. So they were investigating what was going on. And they were asking John, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And John refused to be put into a box but gave them the information they were seeking in a real veiled but powerful way in quoting a key, a key passage from Isaiah 40. Okay? And the passage in Isaiah 40, and those messengers would have known this passage, right? This passage in Isaiah 40 gives us the identity of Jesus, okay? And this is the passage, this is Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 5. This is what it says. It says, a voice cries, here it is, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, if you were paying attention when John gave this answer to who he was, it should have sent alarm bells off, right? Just like I mentioned at the end of the Old Testament was saying someone was going to come. And this is a passage that points to that. So John, instead of saying, you know, I, I am coming in the spirit of Elijah, right? He quoted this passage saying that I'm crying out in the wilderness. And literally, he was doing that. And I'm looking, and my job is to prepare a way, bringing those who are high up in their proudness and their arrogance to bring them low. And those who are low, thinking that they're worthless or un, uh, unlovely, to bring them up, to straighten the hearts of people out and their minds out so that they can receive the Lord. John, in quoting this, was pointing to Jesus. And unfortunately, these inquisitors missed the whole point. They were so focused on the identity of John that they missed what John was talking about. And by the way, Jesus is the key that of all things. If you get his identity wrong, you get all things wrong, but if you get his identity right, the Bible and life will open to you. Jesus is the key to scriptures, and if people are trying to understand the scriptures without Christ, it will be difficult to understand. If you try to understand life without Christ, life will be difficult to understand. But in recognizing Jesus is the Son of God, the Lamb of of God, right? All of a sudden that key fits in and things in life start to open up. What the purpose is, what the meaning is, what God has done, who we are, what eternity looks like. And so people miss the message of Christ because of the messengers, right? 
Sometimes it happens in our day and age where messengers, pastors, preachers mess it up. Sometimes people take the Bible and they look at it and they're trying to disprove, you know, let's see, was there really a, a whale for Jonah? Was there really a lion's den? You know, did God really make the world? And they miss the point of the Bible. First, lead people to who is Jesus, right? And then after they get that right, hopefully by the Spirit of God, everything else is possible. And the other pieces then start to fit into place. So John's testimony starts out saying he's the voice that is preparing the way for the Lord. In saying that in a veiled way, John is declaring that Jesus indeed is the Lord. And he hadn't yet appeared at this point, but this is what he was saying. Now let's continue to read on. This is John chapter 1, picking up the story in verse 24. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, right? These people that are still interacting with John. Again, they asked him, then, okay, why are you baptizing? Right? If you're neither the Christ and you're not Elijah, And you're not the prophet. Why are you baptizing? Verse 26, John answered them. Now, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me. The strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Right? John, the apostle, the writer of this gospel, grounds these events in reality, saying, hey, this happened. Those who first heard this would have known that John was there, would have known his name, would have known where he's baptizing. John saying, hey, here's the evidence. This is what he said, and this is where he said it. But realize that what John is saying in this uh, second response, he's saying, this is the next point, Jesus is the most high. I love John's humility here. He's saying, and unfortunately sometimes people who have a revelation of God think that they are somebody mighty, someone to behold, someone to listen to, someone to esteem to become. John correctly understood himself when he clearly saw Jesus and who he was. He recognized that in comparison to the one that was coming next, the one that he was preparing the road for, that comparison to the greatness of who Jesus was, that he himself was not even worthy to to rise up or reach over and untie his sandals. John was declaring to these religious leaders who were trying to figure things out, and John was declaring to us that the one who is coming behind him, and he gets to the name in just a little bit, is far higher, far greater than any prophet, than any preacher, than any baptizer, than anyone who was before, even Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that this man who is coming is the highest, is the greatest. This is the one who has, his name is above all names. Does this sound familiar, right? John understood that. And he recognized his role saying, may I become less and may he become more, right? What a testimony. And if we behold Christ and understand who he is and what he did and recognize his teaching and what he promised to us, we would see ourselves clearly in the light of who he is. And we would praise him and we would worship him and we would acknowledge him and we also would see us ourselves correctly in his light that he is above all all names. So here is John, this mighty, profound, powerful figure. 
who God announced and prophesied in a miraculous birth. His parents were unable to have children, and God opened Elizabeth's womb. This man, you would think, who could be up there pounding his chest and saying, I have something to say, listen to me, recognized his role, recognized the greatness of Christ. And to these people who did not want to know the truth, his response was veiled. But in his responses, he first said, Jesus is the Lord. I am his messenger to prepare the way. Second, he said, Jesus is indeed the most high. Now, we're going to continue to read. And after these messengers left, the very next day, John proclaims now with unveiled words his thoughts about who this Christ, this person Jesus is. This is John chapter 1, picking it up again in verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. So here now, something that no one has ever heard before, actually two things. And the first is, Jesus is the Lamb of God. This is a completely loaded statement. And for the Jews, this was a neon light statement with significant implications. If you were there and you were anticipating the Messiah to come and they heard John proclaim, Behold, pay attention, stop what you're saying. Look to where I am pointing. There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This would have been a neck-snapping moment, right? Who is this? Where is this person? Now, this imagery of the Lamb of God has been impregnated into the Old Testament over and over and over again. Now, the Jewish people knew that their faith primarily came from the calling of a man named Abram, which we know as Abraham. And as God called him and made promises to him in Genesis chapter 12 and following, at one point, Abram was asked to take his son to the mountain. And you can read about that. They did not bring a sacrifice. And this young man, Isaac, asked his dad, where is the sacrifice. Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb. Foreshadow that God would be the one to give himself to redeem us. Now, as the people of God grew, and if you read through the book of Genesis, you recognize that these people went into bondage. And at the right time, God God called a man named Moses, who was out tending sheep, and he heard on the mountain the angel of the Lord speaking to him from a a bush that was burning but did not go out. And his assignment was to go in and to talk to the Pharaoh, And the Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and there was one plague after another, after another, after another. It was God who was making his point. He was declaring against the little gods of the Egyptian who was the real Lord. The last thing, the last plague, the last um, sign that was given was that the firstborn males of the Egyptians would be killed. Now, that seems pretty harsh, but it was pointing to a significant thing. And so God spoke to God's people and said, Listen, the angel of death is going to show up. But this is how there's going to be a distinguishing between God's people and those who are not God's people. 
I want you to go out to your flock. I want you to find a lamb, a spotless lamb, a pure lamb. And you are to kill this lamb and then take some of its blood and you are to put it over the door places, the doorposts of where you are staying. So that when the angel of death comes, it will see these marks and pass over your house. Does this ring a bell? The Jewish holiday Passover is based on this. What they're saying is that it takes a lamb, the lamb of God, whose blood is spilt, that is applied to the dwelling of your heart, the de- dwelling of your home. And that in the judgment, the second death, the angel will pass over you because one gave his life for another. It's called the Passover. This is the Lamb of God who takes away sins. Now this established the sacrificial system. And you'll see this in Leviticus. You'll see it throughout the Old Testament where there are lambs that were given to cover over the sin The Messiah was prophesied to be like a lamb led to the slaughter. Even though they didn't quite understand it, they tried to, the Jewish leaders back then, reconfigure this. They wanted a mighty hero to rescue them, not a sacrificial lamb. But the Old Testament pointed to this over and over and over again. You'll see in the New Testament, and this is fascinating, right? When Jesus was celebrating the Last Supper, which we now call communion, do you know what time a year he was celebrating this? You read your Bible. Well done. Passover. So Jesus was standing at the Passover feast, the time in which the lambs were sacrificed, the time in which they pointed, and he said... I'm the lamb. I'm giving you my blood. And I'm giving you my body. In me, I am the true Passover lamb, Jesus declared that night. The teaching of the New Testament points to Jesus as the Passover lamb over and over and over and over again. And I have those scriptures in your notes. And finally, the book of Revelation, right? There's 29 times in the book of Revelation that the Lamb is mentioned, including this event that is described for us. And I I, I want you to get your mind around this, right? That we will be there, those who are believers in Christ, understand uh, the symbolism of this title, This is Revelation chapter 5, starting with verse 11. The voice of many angels, right? Numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, get this image in your mind, the greatest crowd ever of both supernatural and natural beings gather together, greater than any Super Bowl, greater than any soccer match, greater than anything, this crowd of myriads and myriads sang together in a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. I want you to be there. To behold the Lamb. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is is huge. And so when this testimony of John the baptizer says, behold, look at, pay attention to this one. We are to do the same. Behold, pay attention to, and if you have not looked at Christ, look to him. For he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins 
of the world. This is his primary purpose. When someone asks you, why did Jesus come? You are to answer to them to take away the sins of the world, including mine. This is why Jesus came in the flesh. This is why the word had to become flesh. In a sermon called, Who Really Killed Jesus? Pastor Vic Pence told the following story, which I'm going to tell to us. He says, years ago, I served in eastern Washington state. A man told, told of driving his Volkswagen one day and being forced to stop for a large flock of sheep crossing the road. As he waited and he watched the sheep crossing in front of him, the phrase, Lamb of God, kept drifting through his mind. So on an impulse, he leapt from the car and asked the shepherd, what does Lamb of God mean to you as a shepherd? Now at first, the shepherd was taken aback, but he saw that the man was sincere. He said, well, I know exactly what the Lamb of God means. He said, every year at lambing time, there are lambs and ewes that don't make it. Now, inevitably, on one side of the field is a ewe, a mom who had lost his, excuse me, her lamb, whose lamb had died. Now, she, just giving birth, is full of milk. But she wouldn't nourish any lamb she doesn't recognize as her own. Now, inevitably, on the other side of the field is a lamb whose mother had died. The lamb is going to starve because no other you will accept and feed it. So the shepherd takes the dead lamb, slits its throat, pours its blood over the body of the living lamb. Now, the mom recognizes the blood and accepts and welcomes and nurses the living lamb. Through the gift of the blood of the lamb that had died, a living lamb is recognized and accepted and nourished and saved. That is the lamb of God. Pence says, you are here in the fold of God this morning. I'm saying to you as well, because you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And now God looks at us through rose colored glasses, blood tinted glasses, and sees us as His beloved children. Jesus has many names and many images we see Him as. He described Himself as the bread of life, He described Himself as the great shepherd, He described Himself as the Lord, but he's also the Lamb of God. Takes away sins of the world. This is not just for the Jewish people. This is for every person who will recognize that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, of the world, and by, by believing in him, we may be saved, received by God. This is a significant testimony. This is a significant issue. And Jesus was not any ordinary lamb, right? Perfect, spotless, without sin. That's the only way he could sufficiently take the wrath of God for our sins upon himself. He had to be perfect without blemish to take our place. Consider this man. John the Baptist points to him saying, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin 
of the world. And then he gives one more evidence of the identity of who Christ is. This is John chapter 1, continuing in verse 31. He said this, I myself did not know him. But for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. Now I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And John said, And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is his fourth testimony. Jesus is the Son of God. And how was John to know this? Well, if you have read the Gospels, you recognize that actually Jesus was a cousin of John. We don't know how much time they spent together, and John was told things. John was actually filled with the Holy Spirit inside the womb of his mother, which is remarkable unto itself. And John went to be prepared for his ministry. There obviously was a time of separation. And God, the one who told him to baptize, said, listen, I'm going to confirm to you the identity of who my one and only son is. When you are baptizing people, and when you get to this one, you will see, however he saw this happening, that the Spirit of God, and if you read the other Gospels, the heavens was opened, and, and God the Father said, this is my son who I love. <laughs> Listen to him, right? And the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus in an anointing way. And that language was not unfamiliar from the Old Testament because if you know your Old Testament, the Holy Spirit throughout the Old Testament would come upon people for a certain task for a certain time and then be lifted off. But the person on whom the Holy Spirit comes down and remains upon he will be, um, this is, this is the sign that this person is the Son of God. And John, as he was baptizing, came to the Lamb of God. He can read in the other Gospels of that interchange. Hey, you, Jesus, John was saying, you need to baptize me. And John says, no, no, you need to baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. And as he did so, John witnessed the Holy Spirit coming down on him. And without a shadow of a doubt, John says, I saw this happen, this happened, this remained on him. So therefore, he indeed is the Son of God. This is powerful testimony. And again, let me just point you to a couple Old Testament passages. This again is from Isaiah, where Isaiah was prophesying about the Messiah. And this is what he said in chapter 11, verses 1 of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from its root shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest and remain. This is in that um, that word upon him. Isaiah again prophesied, Behold my servant, who I am uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him, right? And he will bring forth justice to the nations. And you remember one of the first things that Jesus said in launching his ministry, right? He said, The spirit of the Lord is upon me, Isaiah 61. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Jesus is unlike any other person who has and who will ever live on this planet. 
He is the anointed Son of God. He is the Most High. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Lord. And John baptized people who repented of their sins. And by the way, when we are baptized in Jesus, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's more than just repentance of our sins. It is now being made anew by the Holy Spirit. right? Baptizing in, empowering with, changing us as a seal to live within us. The Holy Spirit is given to us by the Holy Son of God. This is happens so to help us walk in newness of life the baptism of repentance is saying um, i'm sorry for the sins that i've committed against you god we're committed against people that is important element of becoming a christian but when we are baptized when we receive christ okay when we receive christ he gives us the power to live a new life and that's what jesus does This is the testimony of John the Baptist. This is why John, the gospel writer, brought him forward to say, he is the bridge, you recognize him, this is what he said about him. And by the way, us giving testimony about Christ and what he's done in his life adds to this list of growing testimony. Now I'm going to call up Jackson. Jackson, are you here in the back? Come on down. You're the next contestant on Give That Testimony. Come on up. (laughs) So we baptized Jackson not too long ago. It's been like a year, year and a half. I don't even know. And so he's new-ish to the face. And so, hey, you've heard the, the testimony of John the Baptist, and there's lots of testimonies in this room. And by the way, at men's group, we're hearing testimonies, and it's super helpful, right, in sharing our stories. But I said, hey, Jackson... I just asked him actually yesterday. So I said, Jackson, (laughs) can you share us your testimony? And he said, sure. So here he is. Thanks, sir. Go away. Go go do it. Hello. Uh, So let's see here. How do I start this? Well, um, let's talk about who I was before I knew Jesus. Um, I was a degenerate, to say it to put it lightly. Uh, Drugs every day of my life, drinking every day of my life, uh, addicted to porn, having sex with anything that was interested in me at all, lying pathologically, um, manipulating to whatever ends would meet my positive outcomes, hurting people, um, you know, destroying relationships, Uh, need I go on? I mean, my life was in complete shambles. Um, And one night, I was sitting in my bed, and sort of this feeling overcame me, this out of body from somewhere that I had no idea where came crashing down upon me of I have a plan for you, and the way that you're choosing to live your life is uh, not going to lead to a place that you want it to, and it's not going to lead to a place that I want it to, and um, I didn't know what else to do in that moment but to pray and to ask God to forgive me and guide me to wherever he wanted me to go and that uh, if he could help me avoid the path that I was putting myself on, that he would have my life and my soul and uh, every decision that I would make going forward. And so who am I today? Well, all of those things that I mentioned to you previously in my life either disappeared like that or they began a process of healing and restoration that, you know, I'm still working on today. It's part of the sanctification process. Or they have found a way in my life to be used for the benefit of others or the benefit of myself or the benefit of the testimony of Jesus. 
And so through all this, what is my testimony of Jesus? Well, he is clearly and unequivocally the Son of God. He is the second member of the Trinity. He is my restoration. He is my hope. He is my peace. He is my love, how I love others. He is my purpose. He is my path. Um, he's the greatest treasure that anyone could ever find in their lives. <clears throat> and um, I wouldn't give up anything in the world for my relationship with him. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, about a year ago at this time, I got baptized, and I gave my life to Jesus publicly, and, um, you know, Dave asked me if uh, I would, uh, what's, what's a good word for this? If I would um, promote, there, there is no better time coming up on Easter to get baptized, to show yourself publicly that you've committed yourself to Jesus. And so, um, if you're here today, if you've come in from the new year, if you're just starting a relationship with Jesus, um, I can promise you there's nothing better in this world that you will ever find. There's no better commitment you could ever make. And um, the first step of doing that is in your own heart. But another first step is to do that publicly before your friends, your family, and those who love you. And so I would encourage you to step up to the plate and get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all I have to say. Amen. Good job, buddy. Well done. Proud of you. Well done. <laughs> and Jackson continues to live in the way of Christ to uh, every day and looking, you know, like us all, <laughs> and growing and continuing to be passionate about him as are many, many other people. Thank you for that testimony, and thank you for that plug for the baptism. That was great. If you are interested in getting baptized, we're going to do one Easter Sunday, which I've never done before on an Easter Sunday. So if you're considering being baptized, if you're not a believer and want to become a believer, talk to me. And if uh, you want to be baptized that day, that would be a great day to be baptized. Okay, so in conclusion, right? You are a believer, know that your faith in Christ, again, is built upon the testimony of Scripture, the testimony of expert eyewitnesses, and the testimony of the Holy Spirit, right? It's a logical faith. Does it take faith, well, to believe the testimony of other people? Yes. To believe the testimony of the Word? Yes. To believe the Holy Spirit, but there are evidences of God's work in the world. Today, I'm asking that you would behold the Lamb of God again anew, the one who takes away the sins of the world and our sins as well. I encourage you to esteem Him, to honor Him, like Jackson said, that He would be your highest treasure, that you would give up all things because they are so less than who Christ is. So honor him, give him praise for who he is and what he's done for you and what he has done for the world. Again, if you uh, have been convinced today just on John's testimony and you say, hey, I believe I want to talk to you today. We can talk about this. We can pray together. And I and others can help you on your next steps. And you say, well, I'm still investigating. Well, continue to investigate. You can read ahead in the book. Okay, you don't have to wait for next week. <laughs> Go ahead, read the rest of the gospel and keep going, right? Look, investigate. We are praying for you. Know that God is working in you. And so intentionally today, uh, Rob has chosen um, songs about the Lamb of God. And there is a theme. And we're going to end with 
a song singing about the Lamb of God. And I pray that these words will hit you anew this morning.